And now, beginning segment two, Master Xeon here. Uh, so this is the continuation of part one, where I was modeling. I'll do a little bit more modeling, and then I'll jump on over to texturing. So right here, I'm just trying to make like a wing. I decided to maybe add on a little bit more to it, just to have more stuff to mess with. Set inch, set extrude, delete the inset. And that gives me an offset. Just drag it in a plane, added on some circular decals, shrink wrapping it to fit exactly onto the plane. And really there's not a lot to this, it's just basic modeling, extruding, uh, scaling. Right here I try to flatten out the face. And there we go, we got some sort of wing. Now to build the smaller portion of it. We'll just merge that, bring it out, separate it, scale it to fit, maybe put a bevel on top. Oops. And these are the same kind of wings you see popular in like <laughs> manga manga concept me manga max just you know with the little modules on the wings that dictate the direction of the thrust you know all that cool stuff apply some mirrors mirror it on the cube apply the location, I mean the rotation, so it mirrors correctly. And now from here I can just rotate it to fit and get it to fit however it's supposed to. So for something like this, it wasn't part of the original idea, but who knows, maybe I'll keep it, maybe I'll try it out. That's all this is, especially for Concepting it blender is just trying it out But the important thing is with assets like this like little things that you build knickknacks You probably want to hold on to it or something so you don't Have to model it again, or you could try it somewhere else where it may fit better Who knows it all depends on your workflow and the way that you go about these things So I think right here I'm beginning to make sure everything is has a subdivision level of at least one so that way the viewport's not completely lagged up with everything being so heavily modified and coiled around this and that. And what am I making here? Ah, uh, yes, the back module to hold the wing. Start off with a simple sphere. It's going to be subdivided a large amount of time, so might as well just keep it six instead of eight. That way, whenever it's divided by 2, it's just 24, instead of 48, like it usually would. Scale into piece, make it fit, scale on the Z to make it wider. 
and just plug that in. And so I'm going to have to make some modifications to the cloth to make it fit correct around it, but it's actually no worries. We could pretend it was pinned and it was built that way, but who knows? Who's looking at the back? I am, so that's why I closed the array. All right, so as you can see, still the same old tricks as the last video of just subdivided and setting. I decided at the last minute I wanted to add a panel right here to be underneath it, not too thick. By just using Alt S, I'm able to scale it to at least be above the surface that it's sitting on, which is good because otherwise it would have been partially clipped inside of the mesh. I had a little extrude on the outer edges just for no reason. And I still got this ring, might as well um, just add another one down here. Can't have too many ropes. I mean, can't have too many cables surrounding it, or me wrapping it. Add in another circle, extrude it up, add a subdivision with control one. Now I'm just gonna create a little pole to just go in the middle of this little, um, I'll call it a drag modulator. <laughs> There's no name for it. Like I said, it's just a random piece I decided to just add kind of at the last minute to make it look like a, I don't know, robotic angel, who knows. And we'll render for a moment. However, with these textures, it is looking rather bland. So let's get to work.
in tightening it up I just use the inset to do so however for stuff like this you would also you know just add double edge loops but you know using inset is like adding two loops on both sides which is something you'd be doing if you were trying to tighten up the form anyways so keep that in mind and just make sure that you're pressing that I key all the time um, if it's not as hold you're used to just like you know control B for bevel um, just playing around with that tool I was goofing off with making some rocks the other day and found that it has gotten pretty good now compared to the way it used to be. So I added another cog. Subdivisions are a bit high. I can see that even from here. Looks like 32 around the inside. Skelet so it looks like there's teeth. And all we're doing is just creating some wheels. And using that turntable rotation to try to get these things organized and looking decent and the view is quite a pain. Hence my mentioned in the previous videos about you know keeping that local rotation as long as you can I realized that there's some mirrors that just need to be applied and you know maybe if I add a couple more tubes I can connect that to that and it'll make more sense Except that being so off doesn't make any sense. So I just straighten it all back up. Scale it on the Y, subdivide, smooth. And by setting the 3D cursor with period to, I mean by setting the rotation point or the medium point to the 3D cursor, I'm able to rotate it in place instead of by its origin point. So these are all useful shortcuts that you know you should know by now. So now I'm just making sure I grabbed all the components of the helmet. Minus the trim of course. Oh, sorry. I'm all zoning out, just jamming out to the Deftones. All right, so, you know, right here, I'm actually just taking all the small parts and UV unwrapping them. So this part's kind of a pain. UV unwrapping complex objects is something that me and my um, roommates are always discussing. Um, complex objects can be quite a pain. makes you just want to slap some generic textures on it. In a lot of the 3D magazines I read, they always talk about how they just use uh, cube projected textures and then they just use a clever array of stencils and um, just overlay methods to get it all to look convincing. And, you know, that would work if this was, you know, a building or a rock or something insignificant, but this is actually the star character. So, of course, we need some dedicated UVs and decent UVs. And decent UVs I don't make here so I went ahead and used a smart UV project on that piece to just get it to unwrap and it worked out smart UV project here I just want to make sure everything gets some amount of space this part looks horrible so add a cut I mean add a slice there add a seam there I mean yeah add a seam now we got that unwrapped. So for the hat, I mean for the helmet itself, how to unwrap that. We'll dice it down the middle. I 
guess the most important thing about UVs is at least making sure that if you're using this method that I'm using of um, just smart UV project, then you know you want to at least make sure that you're giving the right amount of volume of your texture map to the prominent stuff. Like the helmet, you see it's underneath all these dangle, dangle knickknacks. So, you know, it's not going to need such a large dominating area of the whole map. You know, right there, almost deleted half of it because I was just going to do the lazy way of texturing by texture in half. But if I do that, then it'll be a symmetrical looking model. And even the texture will look symmetrical. And that sort of stuff takes away the personal touch, I think, of making a model is when you try to take the shortcuts. Because if you take a shortcut, people will see it. If you let a rock texture stretch, you know, a 3D person is going to see it and be like, you know, what the hell's up with that rock? Or, you know, if you just decide to use one low poly rock brick texture on a wall, you know, you notice that stuff. And so you don't want to cut those kind of corners yourself. And so with that, I'm just gelling up UVs, making them fit. I make a couple of mistakes through the UV process, but they're easily corrected just by painting it. But now all of that's pinned, so the helmet has its own UV. And of course, 2048, since I use Smart UV Project, you wouldn't want to use 1024 or 1024 on a Smart UV Project this complex, because it wouldn't give any real pixel room for any of the stuff to have any complexity. So I found that 2048 is the minimal to get decent results. And plus, I use CG textures as well to um, just kind of add some variety to the uh, textures I use as well. So that kind of adds to it. So right here, I create a shadeless material. I enable uh, vertex paint, and I just make a cavity material. I went into vertex mode and chose to dirty the vertex colors. After dirty the vertex, I had a cavity map or a cavity um, poly paint job done and with that poly paint I actually baked it to the UV texture but it takes forever look at this it's baking eternally long enough for me to sit here and explain to y'all all the stuff that happened in the blink of an eye but basically you want to um, duplicate the object apply all the subdivisions bake the dirty vertex and then bake that out as a map so that way you have just the cavities as a another um, level of control that you have towards making your maps more personal because I could slap this with metal and call it a day I could slap it with some CG textures painted wall or something and call it a day but it wouldn't be a day it'd be a day of a noob it'd look horrible but by at least multiplying my ambient occlusion map on it or my cavity map because the AO bakes kind of bad as you'll see right here, it actually is baking horribly. Um, that looks horrible, but you know, that might work. So I actually decided to keep it to try it out because I assumed that all those really black areas are just areas that are actually covered up. And maybe using a color ramp, I can pull those values towards ranges that are more workable. But that's just my thought when I'm seeing something like that. I see ranges, you know, it looks really black, really really black, really gray, not much use. But you put in a color ramp, you can choose on one end if you want that black to be black and if you want that other end to be white or if you want it to be that same gray. Um, and then pull those levels to clamp it and get it to be exactly on the edges or exactly on the holes. But that's my mini rant, I guess, on um, just texture in. So right here I create a bunch of shadeless materials, S1 through S4. All of them are shadeless, they have no specularity. And I just apply it to just certain edges, little accents, um, little rings here and there. And this is one of my favorite parts. However, depending on how you get it to look, it could either look like a helmet or you could make your character look like a police officer or an emergency medical specialist which you'll see what I mean once I come out of it. Look, it's starting to look kind of like EMS, or at least that's how it looked to me. But basically, as you see, my texturing process involves me baking the cavity map, which is done by duplicating the mesh, applying the subdivisions, and setting vertex colors, and then just going to bake a full render. Uh, if you bake a full render with shadeless cavity, you only get 
the cavity map with no lighting information. And that's what you want. You want just the information of the cavity, not nothing to do with the lighting, because the lighting is subject to change. You can rotate a light, the character can move his head or move anything. But, you know, I'm just ranting. But, you know, it's been a while since I talked to one of these videos. And, you know, it beats silence. So, more isolations and colorizations. I realized that one half of the head looks very much more complex than the other half of the head. But I'll take care of that just in the very end. It's lonely without those little uh, pads happening. Alright, so now I'm baking out the shadeless texture map. For this one, it for some reason bakes out all the white, then it bakes out all the blue, then it bakes out all the orange. So I was actually looking at this thinking that this may tell me something more about the Blender internal render engine and how it works. That maybe it bakes it on a per material basis, then modulates it all together at the end. Which then gives me a flashback to something I may have heard saying that it does modulate all the materials and then composite them together on a per material basis. But that goes in a little more deeper, I guess, how render engines work. So as you can see, the little insets on the top did not get UV coordinates. This is one of the mistakes I was talking about. Because I made a mistake with that, that doesn't actually get any advanced colorization or any advanced uh, texturing to it. So that's something I could detach and make a separate object later on. Or I can just live with it. However, for this piece... I decided that I'm just going to give it a really small color map. And so I just insert it in the space, make it fit. All right, so baking it out again. And I'll have this little color area. So hopefully that's enough space for me to get the point across with the colorization and not look too jaggy, which is why you would want to give the prominent features a ample amount of size in the UV space but as you can see it looks like it came out fairly decent so I just save all of these whenever it comes to whenever it comes to dealing with the engine um, and the way that it handles the textures that you bake you want to make sure that when you add because I'm using the same UV map space, helmet, UV, helmet tut, UV. I baked the cavities there, saved it as an image. Baked the shadeless material there, saved that as an image. Because when I assign something back to that space, it's going to be some random space. It might even revert back to the UV grid. So the little textures that you make up, just know that there's some sort of placeholders or something. Um, I wish I could explain a little bit better than that, but... I've lost my fair share of textures just messing around with it. So I got the helmet isolated rendering while I set up the material for it. And maybe lower my threads so the computer isn't raped. Turn on these options. These options don't help very much at all. Um, as you can see now, after turning on the U spatial shifts, um, it's taking an incredibly long time for me to just see my geometry for the render. Might as well save it, because that's the first step before it crashes, is strangeness happening. And then right here, I realize I can set up drivers on the threads of my processor as if I'd want a driver to animate that value. So I load up my images in the UV image editor and then drop them onto the um, I drop them onto the node editor where they they become image texture nodes and I begin dropping them. So I use the emission to see what it is that I'm messing with in real time, kind of like the preview sphere. If you were, you know, if the preview sphere, if you were in the internal. So right here, I'm just using a color ramp to make the facing value strictly edging 
and so I'll apply the glossy sh color colorization to the diffuse colorization and then use the mix shader as a mediator between the two so and I just play with the values till I get something that looks right one of my favorite nodes is the layer weight which is similar to how I mess with normals in the compositing stages however this one's a lot simpler and as you can see I was able to just hook up the layer weight to a color ramp so I bring back out an emission I take a look at this other material and it looks the cavity looks like that so throwing a color ramp as you can see the black area is where it fell in an area and I just clamp the values till I get just the edges or you know just what I want so my goal here is to make take what's black and make what's black only scratches or splatter or take what's white and make that only scratched paint or splatter so so you see the the workflow for it is pretty pretty straightforward um, for something like this I've always had an obsession I guess with the materials of scratch paint and stuff like that because you can make stuff shiny all day pull up the you know an in internal just make a ward ISO shader um, crank up the hardness and turn on mirror and you got metal but when it comes to making dirty metal it looks more beautiful to the eye or at least to me it does it shows more complexity more life to it that has been used um, but I guess that's one of the things that happens as a 3D person. So I'm on CG Textures and I'm just downloading particular pictures and just dropping them in my text tutorial textures directory. And then from here, I'll go ahead and drop that in as well. And let's see what we got. So I connect that up and it looks all right. And so I used a color ramp to begin clamping the values because I'm only in blacks and whites right now because I'm making mass. So it doesn't even matter what it's a picture of. And now use a multiply. Multiply the first mask and second mask. And what do I get? I get that. Now that is where the splatter is going to be at. So we bring in another mix shader because now we got to mix something else in there to be the splat with the splat. So we're all splatting. So for diffuse map, I mean, uh, for displacement maps, I'm not an authority on it, but let me tell you this basic psychology that I use when I make my displacement maps using this method here. So the psychology, or at least the psychology I tell myself of displacement maps is middle gray, 50% gray does nothing. White raises, black lowers. So what I want to do is color wrap my splatter layer to be mid gray for everywhere that's white and then be white or darker gray for everywhere that's the opposite and then flip flop them till they flip so right here you see in the displacement that is offset in front of the surface pretty nice and so we just add that in and what do we get when we change this to render Now, it, uh, sorry, so for the rendering, you have to give it a moment before it shows you exactly how much uh, the displacement is affecting it, which kind of drives me a little crazy. Um, this particular tutorial is for a contest, which if I win, you win, which means that you win, me coming back talking about cycles a lot more with a much better card because I'll have bought a graphics card which I desperately need because right now I'm running AMD and while I don't really care about graphics cards I do care about the blender running the best it possibly can and it's, it's not running well I'm using an i5 and my computer struggles I mean I kinda kill it I am running 
a lot of applications in the back and you know I'm rendering videos at the same time that I'm rendering a render in the render so you know these kind of things are taxing the resources on the computer I mean I could go under uh, sampling options and lower down the bounces which they're already at two so that's horrible right there but you know in the end we'll cr um, clamp those back up and see what we come up with now as you can see the paint splatter is actually looking pretty nice um, if I wanted to fine-tune it, I would somehow use the internal series to make a texture of this, bake it to a map, then use texture painting to adjust where the splatters are going, which is what we probably want to do in the end. Now, I'm really digging the black that you see on the inside of that particular panel that's facing us. But if you look on the circle on the edge, though, it actually looks horrible. Um, this largest circle that's over in the back of the helmet. So I bring in a dirt texture and I decide that I'm going to try to texture up the dirt, but first I need to scale the texture. Well, that node's not going to do it, so I import a texture coordinate so I can plug up a UV to a mapping. And then after plug it and then face it, that changes, that automatically connects it as generated, won't do, cut. Connect UV. Mm -hmm. uh, that looks a little better. Looks like it's made of sand. And that looks worse. As you can see, because of the uneven size of the texture coordinates in the coordinate space that the texture looks strange. It, it just looks stretched in some places as you can see right here I mean if I wanted the dirt to work right here I probably could have made it work I could have scaled the texture I could have also made the dirt also assist with the deformation on the displacement but instead I realized that I don't want it to be splattered with dirt in the concept it wasn't dirt it was just paint But the glossy shader that's sharp in the background that's bleeding over from the layer weight, as you can see, is was looking fairly good in the render. Now, in the end, I believe I'll, like I said, use a light box to light the scene because it, as a Blender user, the best thing about our community is the amount of stuff that is shared and given out, which means that materials is something that doesn't have to be a mystery because you can download all the materials that brilliant people make and tear them apart and you don't have to figure out all the model and stuff because there's brilliant people out there uploading brilliant models every day on blend swap that you're able to disassemble yourself and figure out how they did it and this stuff is important it tells you a lot about blender a lot of my knowledge that i get i mainly well i watch tutorials like it's television but in addition to that I also disassemble quite a few blend files to study study the masters. There are some fantastic Blender users out there, and they all share their files. So, I mean, if you don't know about BlendSwap, definitely check it out and begin building yourself a organized asset library of things that are useful, like materials and just small doohickeys so you can build a scene from scratch and not have to oh god I have to put in a ground and then I have to build a bench and then I have to build a street light and I think once I get over that particular part I'll be cranking out stuff every day if my goal is to be an animator I don't know about you guys So I went in texture painting on the UV. I found out that there is no longer the option under image of the UV editor to go into image painting. Now it's another option that you choose where in the same area where you would choose to go under the masking to now paint on a UV, which is kind of strange, but whatever. It's just something you got to remember. I thought they took it out for the longest for about two versions, but they did it. So this version that I'm using here of Blender is 2.65. However, it is the latest version as built by the Blender BuildBot. Um, but strangely, it doesn't have Cycles hair rendering, 
which my older version of this did, but I don't like having to use like three different versions of Blender. I like to stick with just one. I wish I had Cycle's hair, because this person would have some hair, maybe. There's not a whole lot exposed to put hair on, and I know y'all don't want me to, you know, make boob hair. So right here I'm making a texture, right? I'm going on Google, just looking at cloth, you know, it's still a texture. I'm just snip it, borrow a piece of it, hey, put it on this shirt. Um, and I choose this one. Kind of a hideous texture in retrospect, but whatever, it works. So I was originally going to come in, snip it, select the square of it, and then go in Photoshop and use a perspective warp to get it right. But in the end, I realized that to slap it on there does the job. So go in my textures, and this will be my cloth or fabric. Because, you know, for the shirt to look decent, it can't be, you can't just slap a velvet on it and leave it and call it a day because it'll look bad. I don't know how to use the velvet and not get it to look bad, but I'm getting better every day. So we make a new texture shirt. Now in this version, you also see I got the cycles preview render on the left side. It is so awesome to have it, except it's as slow as the viewport when it comes to rendering the previews. So I don't get a whole lot of that enhanced um, enhanced feedback um, that all you NVIDIA users get to get. I know every time I render with cycles, I complain about this, but you know, if you're watching my videos, you're thinking about going into Blender, get NVIDIA. Just save yourself trouble, don't even bother waiting. So I'm just going to scale it, scale the UV coordinates same way as before. Generate seems to work all right, but I do see a little bit of stretching. And once I go over to UVs, it looks even worse. So I might go back to actually generate it. There we go. So UV unwrap it, and I get a proper unwrap. And right here is the scale on values, waiting for it to get less blurry so I can see it better. And we'll add in a RGB curve. RGB curve will allow me to change the color. Just go over to red, just tilt the color. It's like when you still, it's like when you were kids and you'd still bikes and spray paint them, so that they wouldn't recognize it. You know, go in and change the color. Oh, the, uh, the yellow was pretty ugly. I was just judging the complexity of the fabric. So of course, I got to try to make a displacement out of this. I could go into Crazy Bump since I have it on the computer, but that's just another program to open and deal with and make like eight textures and deal with those and. <sighs> It's just easier to stick with the nodes to just make a specialized texture for just this one asset. But believe me, my New Year's resolution for this year is to make all my assets renew reusable. So everything that I make has full intentions of being indexed, later renamed properly, and then set up in a way that I can grab from it in the future along with some way of knowing what's in the file to get. I think if I did that, I could just really just slap together a whole block of buildings and a street full of characters and throw a bunch of vehicles and just go from there. But it has nothing to even do what we're even looking at. So let's focus. So we let this render for a minute so we can admire how nice the fabric looks. Um, I did make a displacement map out of it, but most of the displacement is the shadowing that's being leveled to be a depression. So this isn't necessarily the best way to go about making a render and having accurate displacement maps, but just know that it's the way that I went for mine. And if you can get away with it, then... Maybe you should try to get away with it. Now, this part I hate. Whenever I look at the UV map in the viewport, it shows me the the full aspect ratio of the UV map, and that just makes me groan because 
I wish I could look at it in a textured view in cycles and it looked similar to the render that I have set up and it looked nice, but it doesn't. Might get back to you on that in the future, but just know that just ranting, you know, been in this 40 minutes, been talking for a while now. All right, so I didn't, I'm not going to go over the texture painting of the body in this because it's nothing impressive. I just simply front projected it and mapped it to a reference image I had and then painted it and then cloned it and then multiplied the cavity on it and that was and called it a day and that really is what I did so you know if you want me to, if you want to see it just picture the armor but as a person so time to UV unwrap the shoulder pads and this little uh, lifesaver can't have robots drowning. I think she'd short circuit before drowning, no. And I'm pretty sure a hat would kill her anyways. That is a pr pretty big character flaw. How would my character make it out of water? Well, I'll get back to you on that. So I deleted those interior faces. That made it a lot easier to UV unwrap. However, the siding... Um, since I cut it, actually, it came out really ugly, so I decided to not do that. Right here, I also get to trimming and UV unwrapping. Now, most of the stuff I'm able to just unwrap. Since it, since it doesn't have the back faces, it unwraps very simply. And so that's the same kind of thing you'd be able to keep in mind if you were making a unified mesh just cut it where you think that you can get away with it where it just be dark edges and then whenever it comes to putting it all together maybe you don't have to go back over your texture map and expand your pixels one or two past their boundaries just so when you subdivide it actually looks correct so 2048 by something that didn't look right we'll make another one and like I said, keep in mind that the images that I'm making over here are placeholders. So I'm just going to bake stuff to it and then save them as real images. But tut body med armor, who knows what that picture actually is. And that's just something that you got to keep in mind because, like I said, you will lose images. So I go over that every now and then, just press F3, save it. That's something you might want to commit to memory. F3 will save whatever image is in the image editor, whether it's a render or just a UV. Dirty to vertex colors. Now we're cooking. And right here, I noticed that I'm in the Blender internal, but it's still showing me the cycles preview. That may be a glitch of the program, but I see a ton. But it does correct itself. So bake in the textures. Bake, bake, bake. Sit, sit, sit. So this part takes a while. I think it's because I actually have environment lighting and ambient occlusion turned on from cycle settings that switched over back to Blender Render. Because with this uh, process, I also experimented with jumping back and forth between the internal and cycles. Like I'd use cycles to just do all the materials in the project itself, but I jump over to the internal where I had a diffuse texture that was overriding everything in the render settings. And then from there, I was able to, well, after having it overrided in the texture settings, everything that rendered out came out diffused without me having to actually change the material. So it allowed me to go to render easy. However, when I rendered in cycles, I found out that the render layer still modifies it, but it just gives it an ugly standard diffuse map since the Blender internal doesn't convert over unless you use nodes and choose to. So bake, 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 but it's a nice bake. However, look at all that unused UV countryside. I should have applied the mirror, then unwrapped it, then packed them, then done this. So I could have had it different on both sides. But now this will be lacking, unless I go in and just redo it. 
Spoiler alert, I don't. So continuing on. So we got the cavity map. I think I take a break here to rant about something. And then I'm back. So for this part, I try to make the ambient occlusion map. And as you can see, those stars in the galaxy in the back, that's not stars. That's the ambient occlusion trying to come through. However, I think I need to actually set up some lighting on the scene or something so it doesn't come out in fractions like it is. Like it comes out triangulated in pieces without anything truly showing. And I think that's because the ambient occlusion takes the lighting into account as well. Um, and just waiting on that. And this video is sped up by three times. So keep in mind that this is this was taking a long time. In fact, look at it. It is taking a long time. But the texturing, as you can see, is pretty fast. Once you get your workflow set up and you just do it all in a linear order and have your linear workflow, um, it's pretty straightforward. But you can jump around as well. Like me, I like to render, 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 look at it, preview, preview. While I'm doing it, I'm trying to, I, I've gotten better, you know, I don't preview it as the cube anymore. Um, I'll wait until it starts to look like something. And my same process of giving it the sh SH or nope. That was from the original. No, come on, you're doing it wrong. I realize I'm doing it wrong, and right here I switch it, S1, S2, S3, I don't even need S4, but now I need to get on and give this the police paint job, blue and orange, but you know, I don't want to paint that thing, get that thing out of here, well, and hide that, that one's low poly, duplicate it, hide the, one, hide the original underneath, and just modify and bake off of this, that way we're not baking off of the original, so that's another thing, is all the stuff that you see me take in local mode, I always duplicate it, then hide the original, so that way the original just stays untainted, and I'm just coming back to it with a bunch of textures that's been baked from well-managed versions of it, which are more high-poly. But, you know, I'm probably explaining all this wrong. Select face and assign. Hold ALT to select an edge loop. Press L to select a entire island. That's why I hide the pieces so I can just select islands, but right here it's really random. And here we go with the complete paint job. Nope, still got more work to do. Let's get that out of here and bake them. So for the texturing on the color, I could have done it a ton of different ways. I chose to stick with the edge loops because it gives me this particular look that I'm going for, but I could have just as easily have been projecting from view, painting from just exporting it out to Photoshop and then just having a fill bit on this thing. So for the texture in, I'm just using this way because of the end result that I'm going for. But, you know, if I didn't want to have stripes that had to follow the particular edge flow and was from just a particular view, then yeah, I'd want to export out to Photoshop. And Blender actually has some very good uh, texture painting tools that make exporting to... Um, external image editors a snap. In fact, you just uh, control alt U, go under image preferences, and I believe under system you can set your image editor to be either GIMP or Photoshop or MyPaint or uh, Corel Draw or ACDC or MS Paint or whatever kids are using nowadays. We 
we'll go ahead and save that as a color and let's see what we got so I have the special viewport being this uh, screen layout set up just to make cycles materials same thing always clamping with the cavity I try to clamp in Photoshop and in GIMP and it just it's more dialog boxes it's easier to just clamp it up in here you know sometimes I just open the compositor of blender and I use it like in my own personal image editor start hitting it with curves and multiplies and glares and just overlaying it adding them on top of each other and it's just something you never see like I never um, see anyone else composite their textures using the actual compositor by multiplying the skin on top of the epidermal and subdermal maps and stuff like that you know now in the video we're just adding the various images clamping it making the cavity map affect the uh, I guess the amount of gloss that comes over it try to position the camera don't want a dominating look but don't want a hey look at me kind of look my view my viewport ends right short of the wing so I should just shift B and expand that but I probably don't do it for a minute And this concludes part two. So, leaving a stink render, it'll gradually look better and better because that's how cycles works. Using an i5, that process takes several maps, matches of Halo, and sometimes a small pizza or a mill, and some tea.